he will be talking about NWKMX. Okay, let's see. Everybody can see this and everybody can hear me. Uh, now we don't see your screen right now. We don't see, oh wait, I haven't shared it yet. That's a good first move, right? <laughs> it was there, it just went away. Okay, now we see. Okay. Um, Good afternoon from a uh, very rainy uh, Northern California. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about NWKMEX, um, which is a very large effort between a, a lot of different entities and a lot of national labs, Ames Lab, Ames Lab Argonne, Brookhaven, Berkeley Lab, Oak Ridge, Pacific Northwest, and then also involving the universities of Stony Brook and Virginia Tech. Um, so NWCAM EX better set the next generation of NWCAM. So let me start a little bit for those, uh, especially the students, uh, to kind of motivate why we even want to go and develop scalable software. Um, so when we do computational simulations, our goal is to really get a fundamental understanding of processes chemical processes, reaction, reaction barriers, uh, processes at surfaces and interfaces that are probed often by different types of experimental capabilities. Um, all that information together can lead us to then control of these chemical processes, materials processes that allows us to get uh, build better cat uh, catalysts, build better um, molecular structures for very, various different um, applications. So here's a couple of examples when it comes to more of a sustainable society, uh, which is a an, an highly important aspect right now within the Department of Energy. So if there is processes that we wanna control that are relevant for a sustainable energy future, what are those? Here's some examples, for example, um, on the left, you have photoinduced catalysis of water. You would think, well, that is not photoinduced. So we go and look at excited states and that seems to be a relatively easy problem. But most of these processes happen at very complex interfaces. Um, they have often very complex um, interactions, um, transfer, trans, charge transfer processes and so on uh, that drive, for example, the hydrogen production. Um, Describing this very simplistic models will not get you the right answer for the right reason. Another example that is also used in, in other fields like quantum computing right now as a, as a, a big story is uh, nit the nitrogenase enzyme or FOMOCO uh, uh, as it's called too, which is effectively being able to do the Haber process, which is converting nitrogen and hydrogen to ammonia in a very efficient way while we are taking a couple of percent of energy, the national, the world's energy to energy generate actually fertilizer. So understanding these systems that are very complex, again, have very complex multi-reference uh, wave functions and very complex processes that are often also dynamical processes. These are not just statical processes. We need to be able to describe these and we cannot do this with small scale uh, sim simulation codes. So exascale is then uh, one path uh, if you start to talk about these kind of complicated problems. Uh, if you have scalable codes, they will be able to tackle science problems at a scale and accuracy that you cannot do right now. Uh, what that allows us to do is actually really understand what's happening at the experimental or the uh, nature's level and then use that understanding to probe and predict new chemicals and materials that might have improved properties over what is uh, currently um, available. So how do you get to an exascale computational chemistry code? Well, um, we've been very lucky and uh, a couple of speakers already mentioned this, um, to be one of the projects within the uh, 
uh, exascale computing project, which interestingly is not funded out of a chemistry or a science office, but more out of a Department of Energy applied computing and uh, well applied research for scientific computing department. Um, it's a very big project. It's a multi-billion dollar project that is not just developing applications that we uh, would like to use, but we're also are also developing software technologies that allow us to effectively use exascale computers. So for example, next generation uh, communication libraries and also hardware um, is a component of this. And really this project is focused on bringing all these components together to deliver scientific advantage and scientific advances um, with the next generation exascale, quantum, uh, exascale computers. So let me talk a little bit about NWCAM versus NWCAM EX, because one of the key parts that we've been taking, uh, paths that we have been taking as a team is to instead not try to adjust and update NWCAM, but rather go and do a complete rewrite and redesign of NWCAM. Um, we're using cutting edge programming languages and models going uh, C++ all the way we're fully exploiting all the advantages in computer hardware performance. We're trying to use the best application performance engineering. And we're really trying to also implement and tune the latest computational chemistry methods. And I'll get back to that in a little bit. But also trying to maximize the flexibility and method composition, because we do recognize that we would like to see lots of developers joining our, our effort uh, and we need to make it as easy for people to, uh, to use this uh, uh, infrastructure. Okay, so as I kind of hinted out earlier, um, there is another reason why we want to switch from and uh, kind of do a rewrite of NWCAM uh, instead of going and trying to modify it. The types of questions that are being asked kind of in the slide that I talked about um, with the sustainable energy resources. Uh, the type of sign of the questions are also changing. Uh, think here on the left, trying to get molecular models of ion transport and production of biomass. On the other hand, that biomass that needs to be converted to biofuels, and those happen through very complex catalytic processes, not at smooth, simple interfaces, often at very complicated and dynamic uh, interfaces. These are not the questions that NWCAM originally was designed to really, uh, to really try and answer. So our initial capabilities really will be uh, there to be able to calculate accurate energies and forces at the uh, realistic, oops, for realistic models. So we're taking an approach where we can use an embedding style approach where we can do thousands of atoms with high accuracy Hamiltonians, think couple cluster and beyond, uh, while taking the rest of the system and be able to use that, that as an embedding. Uh, and that embedding at DFT level could be hundreds of thousands of atoms. Okay. This with the gradients allows us to also start tackling nuclear dynamics and looking at through dynamical processes. Um, now you can just go and say, we can uh, run on more and more processors and we can uh, grow the type of problem uh, size that we wanna study. But in reality, uh, to really increase length and time scales, you really need to think about using reduced order methods um, to ensure efficiency. Uh, so our code, <clears throat> our code is really being designed from the ground up to use reduced order methods and not full dense methods. So our view effectively of getting to using exascale computing effic efficiently to start tackling very large problems is to combine the increased power of exaflop. And again, we don't gain a lot with exaflop with the complexity of the methods that we have with reduced scaling to really get large factors of improvements uh, in performance so that we can actually start to, to probe potentially dynamics of these large systems. Just as a side thing, um, 
the Exascale Computing Project sounds like, oh, that's just developing lots of software and tools, but effectively within the Department of Energy, the ECP is a construction project, which means we're not just developing code so that we can do science, we actually have to make re meet real targets. Um, so our target for the systems that we want to look at is uh, that we have chosen is ubiquitin, which is 1200 atoms. Um, that's about 40,000 basis functions. Um, what, is then the what is then our target? Well, our target is what they call a figure of merit. I'll not go into detail on how that's calculated, of 50. What does that mean? Well, um, in the roughest sense, it means we want to get a uh, performance improvement of about a factor of 50 over the codes that we have had so far. Um, kind of the previous speaker uh, uh, talked all about it, but effective use of GPUs is going to be essential for the success of NW X. So here is kind of a, an early snippet of some of the results that we have been able to, to show uh, that we can actually get good performance out of GPUs. This is a small uh, fragment I showed up on a previous slide. That's kind of a subset of the ubiquitin. So it's a relatively small system, it's 231 basis functions, uh, but we, able, we have been able to do some uh, couple cluster level calculations. And in this case, it's uh, the triples mainly um, on a GPU. Um, so this is actually a four GPU system where we had combination of NVIDIA AMD uh, types chips. What is interesting is that we really implemented this originally for an NVIDIA uh, V100, well, an NVIDIA GPU, but we are able to use tools like what they call Hippify to translate the GPU code into something that can be utilized effectively with AMD. So let's talk a little bit about the NWCAM design. Um, and it's really focused on um, modularity and composability. Um, the structure, and this is these are uh, graphs by uh, by. Um, geez, I forgot his name. Sorry. <laughs> um, graphs that uh, kind of give you an overview where we effectively have a very low-level parallel zone, which is runtime. A plug and play that allows us to kind of uh, combine pieces and do a runtime manipulation of the components of a call graph. So this connects a little bit back to what uh, Ed was saying earlier today. We have a lip chemist, which has a lot of the key functionalities that you would effectively expect of a computational chemistry code that all are integrated together into what's called SIMD or a simulation development environment which provides kind of standardized application programming interfaces um, that you can use to build pretty much everything that you would need at a higher level of a computational chemistry code. The way, the reason this is structured this way is because we can then do workflow integration and we can also use this to do very rapid prototyping. The rapid prototyping comes also in in a different way because we are bringing together this time also C++ and Python um, so that we can actually run everything with a Python front end. The other thing that uh, we have done is uh, use kind of a natural expression of objects. Effectively, we have a high, high level domain specific language that has things like bras, cats, operators, wave functions, and so on. So for the domain experts, it would be easier to start writing code that kind of naturally aligns with the uh, language of the uh, of what you would be writing in your notebook, for example. The DSL also provides an easy way to uh, read and write code, and it provides uh, a computing uh, the computing complexity within this high domain specific language gets kind of um, encapsulated. So as I said, the middle layer that kind of is the providing the API is the SIMD or a simulation development environment, which is really going to be a framework for managing uh, scientific simulation. So your traditional routines that you would be normally writing as a, 
as a student or as a person writing computational chemistry codes are stored in modules, which are really highly tuned and self-contained components. Um, those components and modules are really coupled only at runtime. Um, if you really look at it and, and start thinking about how this design looks like, it feels a lot like an app store design that you would get uh, in most of your phones or our laptops. It allows a user to effectively choose which models to run and also be able to adjust the components of the modules. We have a concept of sub modules that could be swapped in, swapped out. Think of, I want to have a different solver. Well, uh, if I have an SCF module, I can just switch out a solver module and, and, and run. Um, there's also a high level of automation in here. So we are really doing a lot of memorization uh, that allow us to kind of reuse information that might be in memory. Um, it also provides us then a natural mechanism for a checkpoint restart. And it also provides us an, effort, an, an easy avenue to do very high level coarse grain parallelization. So I mentioned Python. So if anybody has looked at C++ and Python, uh, most of the stuff that is being done is done at uh, using CP, um, sorry, PyBind 11. We've chosen a slightly different approach. Uh, this is actually an effort that comes out of um, high energy physics, uh, an effort that is done by researchers uh, related to CERN's uh, accelerator. Um, they have been developing a package called CPPYY that allows you to actually generate bindings automatically just from C++ headers. So we actually have to write almost no code to get our C++ uh, header files included. Um, we can then also use parallel computing uh, through MPI for Pi, for example, and directly interface into the C++ code. Um, what's also nice, of course, with Python, it, it provides an easier interface with ML tools, with data storage tools, data science tools in general. And again, most people nowadays like to work from uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, for example, or Jupyter Hubs, uh, where Python is, is kind of a standard front end that is being used. Okay, so let me talk a little bit through some of the components uh, that we have uh, uh, been developing so far. Um, first of all, we want to do the large scale, right? So Gaussian basis SDFT is going to be a critical component there. Um, one of the challenges when it comes to um, uh, Gaussian DFT is the exchange correlation. Uh, yes, I know integrals is another uh, important part. We are actually looking at doing that in a semi-numerical way. Um, so that we don't have to deal with too many integrals, um, or at least too many complex integrals. Um, the hard part of, uh, of exchange correlation is that the quadrature um, really gets segmented into small spatially localized orbitals. Effectively, this could be very highly parallel, but there is a lot of challenges with the imbalance. Um, the design that was really taken in, in, in account, and this is done by David Williams Young, uh, who is at LBL, is really to decouple communication for computation. And you've heard this already before also from Ed, uh, that is really something that is necessary to get performance. Um, and the architecture is really designed to target multiple accelerator architectures in a single code base. Uh, as you can see on top, we have CUDA, Sickle, and HIP that all allow us to build these library, uh, build uh, the exchange correlation. But it's an interesting uh, aspect is because our modular software design, it allows us to actually build libraries that can be used by others. So for example, the exchange CXX um, is a library that you can download right now that can evaluate exchange correlation functionals on an accelerator. Um, so, this is a library that you don't need NWKMEX directly for. You can actually integrate that in your own codes. And we can get performance. Um, the, the figure on the left is kind of a set of different systems. Uh, the log scale is, is a little bit tricky to look at, but we're getting an order of magnitude uh, performance increase when we go from CPU to GPU. 
And if you look at a direct one-on-one -on -one comparison uh, with NWKM, the old DFT versus the new DFT, uh, the initial implementations on it from a CPU to a GPU shows uh, at least a 30X uh, performance imp improvement. Um, while we were working on DFT, we also uh, generated a port of libxc uh, to CUDA. So that is also available for the community to use. Now, um, those were some small systems. We actually did Ubiquitin. Um, so we can actually get uh, between five and 30X improvement depending on the, the problem size. Uh, then we'd wanna do exchange correlation on a GPU versus a CPU on NWCAM. Uh, the biggest challenge that you will see over time if you go to larger and larger compute resources uh, is of course that while the computation will scale linearly for a while, it will take over, will be overtaken by load balance uh, and that will affect the strong scaling limit. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, there is ways to get from uh, CUDA and, and GPUs that are NVIDIA based to an AMD. And this is also uh, something that we have found with DFT. Um, we have been able to use things like HIPFI or even use HIP Magma uh, to actually get performance out of a AMD. Uh, so here is uh, something that uh, Jack the Slipper was talking about this morning, uh, the roof line model. But effectively, the best you could do is kind of this blue line. And we are getting pretty close in performance when it comes to uh, what we would expect out of a hardware like this. So next, let's switch to this kind of higher accuracy part. And that is the uh, NWCAM couple, NWCAM EX couple cluster. So the first piece I'll show is the Koleski couple cluster, um, where we've been able to go from something that NWCAM or would be running to NWCAM EX, where we can see improvements that range from 120X when we run NWCAM on an older system to uh, NWCAM EX on the current available system. Now we can also run NWCAM on this current system and then the performance improvement is of course not as good, but that's still a factor of 30-ish uh, that we can get out of that. This is couple cluster. This is not the triples, which is even more natural for a GPU. This is a single iteration of a couple cluster calculation. Um, what we did here is not just go to a GPU, but also use Koleski factorization on the couple cluster to get performance. Again, we're looking at ways to get reduced complexity in our models. This scales to, um, as you can see, the numbers are still nicely trending down. Um, there is of course a slow uh, slowing of the performance, but you have to realize that when we talk about 250 nodes, we're talking about 1500 GPUs and 500 power nine IBM processes that are used for a calculation like this. So these are not small simulations, small scale simulations anymore. And we can get pretty good performance out of that. Um, at scale. Now, of course, the triples is, uh, the perturbative triples is a little bit easier relatively to scale because it's effectively a large number of um, dense tensor algebra operations, uh, blast three operations, uh, which is what the GPUs are very good at. Uh, so this is an example of that, uh, a smaller fragment. Again, it's about 1200 basis functions. Um, that we have be able to run on a large number of nodes and get pretty much linear scaling on. We do not get full percentage of peak. We only get about 30% of peak, but it's still scaling. And uh, this is a good sign for the simulations that we wanna do um, and for our performance metrics that we have to meet. Okay, <clears throat> then finally, um, the most reduced scaling couple cluster that we're after is the DLPNO uh, couple cluster. This is work uh, that uh, Ed Flav has been involved in for many, many years. Um, we have actually a way to do this. Uh, we effectively can write codes that is very similar to this. Uh, 
uh, in a uh, in a C++ way, uh, which allows us to set up index spaces and define the tensors. Um, what we can then do is actually compute all of the terms on a GPU using existing the existing TAM infrastructure. And what it is, what is very interesting, uh, at least to me, is that we can effectively write this in small blocks of code. This little p and couple cluster uh, triples is only 115 lines of code. So that is a very good thing to have, smaller pieces of code that are modular and can be connected. So initial results are, there is very little results yet. We're working on getting uh, uh, performance numbers and scaling, but we actually have been able to get uh, the DLP and O couple cluster to work. Um, and we can get actually uh, do analysis on performance in the way we wanna operate, how we prune, um, how we deal with uh, the equation structure that we're going to uh, operate on dealing with inter intermediate tensors uh, to look at the ways we can do reduced operation costs. And we can get very efficient numbers out of this uh, code so far. Okay, since my time is almost up, let me uh, tell you a little bit about what's going to happen soon. Uh, we'll have an initial release of NWCAMEX. It will have reduced order implementations of uh, localized hydrophobic DFT, DLP and LMP2, couple cluster and triples. There will be a plane wave code, a, a new C++ plane wave code in, involved. We will have uh, energy gradients and embedding, uh, reduced order solvers for efficiently, effectively, if you have reduced order methods, you need to make sure you also have reduced order solvers to get performance. It will support all the big DOE machines and it will be released open source under Apache 2.0. So summarizing, um, the exascale computational chemistry code and WKMEX will be available soon. Um, our modularity and the structure that we have chosen allows us for easy prototyping and extension. And we will have a Python front end through what's called CPPYY. And then rest me to uh, acknowledge that this is funded through the exascale computing project and uh, that this is done by a large uh, team. Uh, and some of the slides that I've been using come from Teresa Windows, who is our PI, and uh, Raya Richards, who has uh, especially been working on the, the uh, program model and infrastructure that is used in MWCAMEX. And that, with that, I'll leave a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Bert. I see there is one question in the chat. Uh, Tibor is asking, so there are two questions. First is, do you think F1 to explicit correlation would be viable on GPUs? <laughs> Good question. And I would say that's a question you should add, ask Ed Flair. He is the expert when it comes to F1 too. Um, I would think yes, but uh, I would not be willing to uh, bet my... Uh, <laughs> Bet anything on that. And then the question, the other question is, you showed large systems with relatively small basis sets. Um, yes, and I totally agree. Uh, we will be going to larger basis sets and we believe that, uh, um, yes, your, your sparsity becomes a little bit more of a problem if your basis sets are too extended. But again, I think with the DLP and O approaches and some of the other uh, reduce scaling approaches, I think we can still get good performance and scaling. Thank you. Are there any other questions? One more in chat. Yeah, Ye is asking, uh, will the development be done openly? Yes. As I said, NWCAMEX will be available soon. It will be open source released uh, under Apache 2 license. Yes, it will, it's going to be open. Uh, we want to make sure that our initial version is something that um, is performant and has all the functionality that uh, our developers and potential users 
uh, would want to have? Uh, sorry, I, I I want to emphasize to be developed openly in the future, not just open source. Open. So, in in what do you mean? Actually, being able to contribute? Yes. Yeah, I can see the commits history, then all the evolution and yes. the, make the whole my voice. the whole stack will be open. It's currently a private repo. Uh, once we have the version that uh, that makes sense, um, the whole GitHub repo will be opened. Great, thanks. 